that's an example of harmonic distortion. Ruth, come up here. Oh, okay. I'm just going to say this really well. Look at that camera. The main thing I'd like to say tonight is this is a great opportunity for all of you to ask some questions. So Yasos is one of those amazing people that is very, very creative and he's also really, really organized and um, very, very developed uh, on left and right brain. So Yasos has all kinds of stuff that he can share with us tonight, but the thing that's going to really make this evening a great opportunity is for you all to ask your questions. So start thinking about it. and. Um, if you have questions that are pertinent to what Yasas is talking about at the time, go ahead and ask it. Other word, otherwise, just wait till the end. And other than that, welcome to Yasas. Thank you. Thank you. That was Bruce Tambling, and he's responsible for getting me here. Thank you, Bruce. So welcome everyone to Hotel Business Administration 301. <laughs> uh, before I start, I want to get a sense where you're all at so I can talk appropriately. How many of you are involved in or interested in music creation? Okay. How many of you are involved in or interested in using sound for healing or sound therapy or music therapy? How many of you are involved in or interested in metaphysics? <laughs> How many of you are involved in or interested in consciousness? And lastly, how many of you are involved in or interested in Sex. <laughs> See, I don't need to know the answer to that question. I asked that question just to get all of you really alert and awake. <laughs> That's why I ask it. Okay, so we're in Appreciation Hall. Um, I want to give first comment on appreciation, but let me say that when Bruce invited me to do this, I started collecting tips that I could share with budding musicians, people who want to get into creating music. So I've accumulated a whole bunch of t uh, tips, which I want to share with all of you. And after that, it's going to be wide open questions and answers. You can ask questions about anything. Anything? Yes, anything. Anything, OK? Uh, and in the meantime, while I'm giving my tips, if you have questions about what I'm saying then, you can ask then. Otherwise, save it for the questions and answers at the end. Now, talking is very left brain. And just so your brain doesn't get bored, we're going to periodically sprinkle it in with our music or visuals just to keep it interesting. Keep the right brain stimulated. So we'll be bouncing back and forth between music and uh, music or visuals and talking. OK. Are you all comfortable? OK. I want to talk about appreciation with respect to music, or more general, with respect to art. I encourage you, when you're creating music, do not try to please other people. Try to please yourself. Very, very important. When you're trying to please other people, you're guessing. You're stabbing in the dark. You don't know. You don't have a clue. When you're trying to please yourself, you know exactly what you like. You know exactly what you don't like. Now, here's the bottom line. No matter what you create with music, there will always be some people that like it, and there will always be some people that don't like it. So here's the basic formula for how it works. Art appreciation boils down to consciousness matching. If the person perceiving the music is in a similar consciousness or similar mindset as the one that created it, they'll love it. They think, this is great. This is the best music on the planet. If they're on a different level of consciousness, they don't get it at all. And if they're on a much higher level of consciousness, it's kind of crude and simple. <laughs> For example, when I do my music, I try to make it as celestial and heavenly as I can. But there are angels who are cruising way higher than me, and they listen to my music and say, well, God bless him. At least he's trying. <laughs> <clears throat> so music appreciation boils down to consciousness matching between the perceiver and the creator of the music. This also applies to all of the arts, painting, architecture, sculpture, all of it. So no matter what you do, people with a consciousness similar to you will love it. 
and people with a different consciousness won't, and that's the way it is. Personally, I'm happy with that arrangement. I like that arrangement. So because of that, don't waste your time trying to please other people. You're stabbing in the dark, you're guessing. Please yourself. That's something you know about. You know what you like. Do that and know in advance that not everybody will like it, but people whose mindset is similar to yours will love it as much as you do. Another suggestion is be heart guided, not mind guided. Let your heart be the boss. Don't let your mind lead the way when it comes to music. Music is primarily an emotional communication. There are many years ago when I was auditioning guitarists for a band I had. And some of the guitarists, when they were talking to me on the phone before we met, said, I graduated from uh, Juilliard. Like, oh wow, you know. Well, the Juilliard graduates were like exquisitely sophisticated machines. They could place things so smoothly, so perfectly, but with absolutely no feeling. It was like a machine. There's no heart in it at all. So don't do that. Don't be a, an efficient typewriter. Follow your heart, not your mind. Uh, a lot of people like to think of their mind as being the boss, but your heart is really the boss. And that's especially true with music. Be heart guided. Don't be, you know, mechanical like that. Uh, <laughs> When I graduated from high school and went to Cornell University, I was studying different majors like anthropology, psychology. But my high school teacher kept phoning the director of music at Cornell University saying, this guy's a great musician, you gotta have him in the Cornell band. So the director of music at Cornell University kept phoning me up trying to persuade me to get in the music department. I said, no, -uh, no way, I'm not gonna do it. He couldn't persuade me to do it. And the reason I didn't was because I was hearing unusual music in my mind and I didn't want to be programmed by their idea of what music is, quote, supposed to be, because I knew I was hearing my own idea of what music could be. Very different. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening here <laughs> at Foothill College, but then, you know, it was just like, this is how music's supposed to be. Forget it. You know, I told them I want to create a whole new type of music. They thought I was crazy. Well, is it jazz? No. Is it pop? No. Is it classical? No. Then what is it? They couldn't get that new kind could exist. When I went to... Uh, Columbia Records trying to release my first record. All they knew was already established success formulas for music. They couldn't foresee any new genre being popular, which is new age music, it became very popular, well known since then. But then they couldn't see it, they couldn't see it. Where's the lyrics, where's the catch, where's the beat? You know, they just totally didn't get it. So very important, let your heart be the boss. When I'm recording, I might record a part many, many times before I get it just the way I like. How do I know when I get it just right? I listen to my heart. I play it and I play it back and I listen to it. If my heart goes, mm -mm -mm, then I didn't get it. When my heart goes, then I know I got it. Then I'll go on to the next thing we're going to record. So I let my heart guide me like an okay or not okay meter if that was a good take or not a good take. And if it isn't a feeling in my heart, I just keep doing it. I don't care how long it takes. Now, for those of you that perform live, how much do you need to practice for a live event? I learned this when I was doing piano recitals as a little boy. It's unrealistic to expect that in the actual public performance, you'll do better than average. And it's also unrealistic to expect that you'll do worse than average. So if your average practice set is satisfactory to you, then you're okay to go public. It, the average has to be acceptable by your standards of whatever acceptable means. Yeah? I have a question for you, Yasas. When you prepare for your current concerts, you play a lot of instruments, so you have to go into a practice period so that you can be at the level that you want to. Is that right? At least one month. Yeah. How many hours a day do you practice during that one month period? I do one practice in the evening, uh -huh. however long it takes. Thank you. I might repeat one piece two or three times if it's, if it's a week. And when I do the whole practice set through all my six instruments, if some are weaker than others, I'll give more focus on the weak ones. A great magician, Doug Henning, said, you practice till the difficult becomes easy. Then you practice till the easy becomes effortless. Then you practice 
till the effortless becomes automatic and then you practice till the automatic becomes beautiful. Difficult, easy, effortless, automatic, beautiful. If you really want to be slick on stage. <coughs> Okay, now I'm going to be talking about how sound can heal. I do a whole evening workshop just on sound healing. It's called Using Sound for Light Body Activation and Healing. And so, you know, I don't have time to get into it here like I do then. But I'll just skim over the superficial structure of it. There are four basic ways that you can use sound for healing. Yeah, it's on. And I want to briefly discuss each of these. The first one is physical resonance, the second one is emotional resonance, the third one is intention, and let's see now, what's the fourth one? <laughs> the fourth one is beliefs. Okay, so I'm going to go into each of these. <clears throat> physical resonance means that sound is pulsing air pressure waves, bouncing against your body, and the pushing of air pressure waves can rearrange things in your body. If you have a coherent sound, an organized sound, a symmetric sound, it can reorder the molecules in your body in a more orderly way. If you have a dissonant sound, a chaotic sound, a random sound, it'll tend to dissolute you towards more uh, illness and ill health. <coughs> so physical resonance means the vibrations of the sound have an effect on the vibrations of the molecules in your body. And if they're coherent sound, it can tend to induce good health. <laughs> what is good health? It means a more coherent energy field. Ill, Ill health is a more random or incoherent energy field. Hans Jenny did a study he called cymatics, which is very profound because he made it visually obvious how sound can create order out of randomness. Now when sound does healing with uh, physical resonance, it's not usually complicated sounds like a symphony orchestra or a band of 20 people, a <laughs> Stan Kenton group. No, it's usually just one sound or one instrument, like a person toning or rubbing Tibetan bowls or hitting a gong or hitting a tuning fork. <laughs> There's a dolphin go swimming with people and check people out, see their aura, and put out a sound, zoom, for that chakra, then next chakra, yeah, different sound, then yeah, 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 tune them up, just by making sounds that he aimed at each chakra of the person swimming. So, I'm going to show a very brief video, just five minutes, that demonstrates some of Hans Jenny research. He would have a speaker, and on top of it, he put a plate with a very fine powder, and you have a camera looking at the plate, and then he'd put simple frequencies of sound on that speaker and would shake up the randomness of the powder into magically it would rearrange itself into perfectly symmetric patterns. So this is a very gut level intuitive sensing of how sound can create order or increase coherency out of pure randomness. Okay, I'm gonna put it on. The human voice can also be made visible with a simple apparatus. The various vowels show typical characteristics depending on the nature of their sound. We can see the spectrum, as it were, of the sounds.
comes out as a sequence of vibratory patterns. We can see a melody. Vibrating glycerin, we see continuous waves which form the queerest figures. And yet, the extraordinary things we see here are simply and solely the effect of vibration. We can also use different shapes of plate. Here we have a triangular plate with a crystal attached to its underside and produce a sonorous fit. We change to a higher note and see a rather more complicated figure. Lycopodium alone, a sonorous figure, Transition to a mobile flowing phase. And back again to the figure. Because of the reduced adhesion, the particles of iron have certain degrees of freedom. They can move, fall into line, form figures, and almost dance, but only in obedience to the vibration imposed. Here, by way of contrast, is a sonorous figure, a static figure instead of a dynamic one, representing the opposite pole in the vast range of phenomena that make up the world of vibration. Does that give you a good intuitive sense of how sound can physically rearrange molecules to create more order and symmetry out of randomness? That's the direction of good health. One, uh, many ways to do this, but one very powerful way is toning, especially within yourself. Uh, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> If you have some repressed emotion from some trauma that happened 13 years ago, that is stored as an energy block someplace in your body. And stuck energy in the emotional body also creates stuck energy in the chi or your vital life force, which means those organs aren't getting enough life force and therefore you may have health problems with that organ wherever that spot is. An easy way to get rid of it is toning. You just close your eyes, Think about that emotional block. Start making sounds with your mouth, doing different pitches and different vowel sounds. You could do vowel sounds like you could try different pitches. 
And you might find a certain, you might find a certain pitch, a certain sound that resonates with a certain part of your body. And once you find it, just keep resonating that sound because it'll shake it up, shake it up, shake it up. So that's so much energy it shatters. Just like an opera singer singing a pitch, which is the pitch of a wine glass shattering the wine glass. It energizes it. It energizes it so much you can't hold the energy, it explodes the same way. And so when you do that, you can use toning to break up emotional blocks, and when that happens, the emotional energy there flows smoothly, which means the prana and life force also flows smoothly, which means those organs that happen to be there get enough life force, which means they get healthy. So that's one of the four ways you can use sound for healing, physical resonance. <clears throat> the next one is emotional resonance. In a nutshell, here's how this works. Obvious, everybody knows music affects your emotions. Emotions also affect your health. If you have harmonious music, it tends to induce harmonious emotions, which has a beneficial effect on your health. Also, harmonious music tends to induce optimistic thoughts, and then both the harmonious feelings and the optimistic thoughts both tend to induce good health. So the way Emotional resonance is you play music that for you is harmonious, happy, uplifting, makes you feel better. That makes you feel better emotionally, it makes more optimistic thoughts, and the harmonious emotions and the optimistic thoughts both have an extremely positive effect on your physical health. <clears throat> the next way is intention. The interesting thing about intention is it can ride on top of a sound wave. You can have one wave right on top of another wave, and I'll give you a, uh, an analogy. If I'm standing by the side of a lake and a speedboat goes by, eventually the wake, the waves from that speedboat reach the shore, and there's small rolling waves like this coming to the shore from the speedboat, right? And while those waves are rolling in like this from the speedboat, if I get a little pebble and I throw it in the water, the little pebble will make tiny little waves that go like this, but because the big waves are coming in, the little wave is riding on top of the big waves like this. So you can have a little wave riding on top of a big wave, in the same way you can, have emo you can have intention riding on top of sound waves. You can superimpose intention on top of sound waves. Now, the obvious thing is to have the intention when you're actually creating the music, and I do that very powerfully I always intend to have extremely uplifting effects when I create my music. But it's so far out that it doesn't even have to be music that you created yourself. You can even superimpose intention that someone else created 30 years ago. You might have a friend that's sick and you want to play them some uplifting music. You get a CD that someone else created many years ago. You bring them to your friend, you put it on. You can intend that the sound coming from that CD has a beneficial, healthful effect on your friend and your intention will actually ride the sound waves and impact your friend. So intention is very powerful and it's not limited to the person creating the music. It can be anyone using music that anyone created. Intention is a very powerful way to heal. And I encourage you to use it when you're creating music, but even if you're never gonna create music, you can use it on music someone else created just by wanting to. Intention is very powerful and it can just ride on top of the sound waves just like the little waves from the pebble rode on top of the big waves from the boat. <clears throat> the last way that sound can heal is through belief, which you can think of as the placebo effect. You can take the most destructive sound you can possibly think of, maybe a uh, sound of a machine gun, or the sound of a jackhammer. Just think of some really destructive sound. And if you can convince someone, oh, this is a sacred sound from Tibet, the sound is very healing. You only need three minutes of the sound and you'll be healed. Well, the amazing thing is, if you can convince someone that it's healing to where they actually believe it, if they believe it, then it will be healing for them. Beliefs are very powerful, actually beliefs are very powerful in all aspects of your life. That's how you create your reality. But in this case, they're useful for sound healing. If you can 
persuade someone to believe that something's healing, then by God for them, it really is healing. <clears throat> Since you're musicians, you probably know about filters. I want to share a metaphysical concept with you. In my understanding, there's not just one version of reality that we're all experiencing. There's an infinite number of versions of reality, and they're all real, and they all coexist simultaneously. Just like with cable TV, there are many channels on, they're all on at the same time, they're all equally real. You only get to see one channel at a time, but the ones you're not seeing are just as real as the one you are seeing. They're all real. When you change the channel tuner, you get a different station. But the one you were watching before is still there and it's still just as real. Well, the channel tuner for your reality is your beliefs. When you change your beliefs, you're changing which channel you're on. But the transitions are so smooth that you think there's just one external reality. There isn't. There's an infinite number of parallel realities. So here's what beliefs do. Beliefs, a belief is like extremely narrow, high-Q bandpass filter that of all the infinite versions of reality that are out there, it just filters out absolutely all of them except for the one that aligns with the beliefs that you're holding. And then you see just that narrow slit. This is what I believe, so this is what I'm seeing. So no matter what you believe, you're absolutely correct because you will get versions of reality that uh, verify and confirm that you're absolutely right in having those beliefs. All beliefs are self-validating, and if they weren't, then they wouldn't be generating experiences, which is what they do. So think of your beliefs as a filter, a bandpass filter, a high-Q bandpass filter that filters out all the versions of reality you're not believing in, so you only see the version you believe in. <clears throat> There's a great book I want to recommend to you if you're interested in uh, music. Tom Kenyon, The Hawthorne Material. I don't have any economic tie to this book. And I'm recommending this book just for two specific chapters in this book. Makes the whole book worth $100, just these two chapters. These two chapters have a profound understanding of sound. Chapter three, feeling and human evolution. You will get such a profound understanding of feeling. And of course, music is all about feeling. And then chapter 10, Sound as Key. Get this book just for those two chapters. Chapter 3, Feeling and Human Evolution. Chapter 10, Sound as Key. This has a profound interdimensional understanding of the effects of emotions and the effects of sound. I encourage you to get it. <clears throat> the Hawthor Material, H-A-T-H-O-R by Tom Kenyon. On the piano, there are many octaves, and the same note keeps reappearing different octaves. Emotions work the same way. Emotions are on frequencies. They're in a very high frequency range, but they still work on frequencies. <clears throat> and they also work on octaves. And I'll give you an example. You can have the emotion of gladness. I'm glad. And if you double the frequency, which means an octave higher, like la, La, that's an octave higher, it's twice the frequency. If you double the frequency of gladness, which means one octave higher, then you get happiness. An octave higher, joy. An octave higher, ecstasy. An octave higher, rapture. If you go about four or five octaves higher than that, then you hang out where the angels hang out. That's, that's the emotional level they cruise at. Rare for humans, one of my uh, intentions with my music is to introduce people to higher octave versions of harmonious emotions that they already know, but just like, a uh, higher octave version of love or higher octave version of ecstasy. <clears throat> Musicians are merchants selling emotion served on the platter of sound. What musicians are not really selling is not the sound, that's just how it's delivered, that's just the delivery medium. What they're really selling is emotions. For example, uh, if you like romantic emotions, you might like country music, if you like extreme rage and anger, you might like a heavy metal. If you like uh, ecstatic feelings, you might like Yasso's music. <laughs> 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 My specialty is uh, ecstatic feelings. That's what I specialize in. Now the interesting thing is, emotions are in different frequencies, and negative emotions are very small, limited frequency range whereas harmonious emotions are unlimited and infinite. Let me explain. There's a certain frequency 
which is the cutoff point between negative emotions and positive emotions. Negative ones are lower frequency. And that cutoff point is in the area of melancholy. You can get slightly higher than melancholy and it's positive, slightly more negative and it's negative. And melancholy goes lower and lower and lower and lower. And it can only go so low, it goes down to zero, which is being frozen in fear. You can't get any lower emotionally than being frozen in fear. That's zero frequency. So negative emotions are a finite, limited frequency range. With positive emotions, there's no upper limit. You go up to infinity. Just keeps going up. When I tuned into God, I sense him being in a state of like, like a really sublime, blissed out state. And also extremely, infinitely loving everything. So, harmonious emotions go from that cutoff point between negative and positive in the range of melancholy all the way up higher and higher octaves. Then there's no upper limit, so it goes up to infinity. Whereas negative emotions go from that melancholy point all the way down to zero, which is frozen in fear, which is a limited range. Popular on Earth, but still a primitive, uh, limited range. <laughs> I did a concert at Esalen Institute, and the next day I, uh, I was speaking to some of the staff members. Do you know where Esalen Institute is, Big Sur? Yeah. And I asked the staff members, well, what did you think? Said, oh, it was nice. Said, well, what's the matter? What, what didn't you like? He says, well, you did all this ecstatic, blissful stuff, but you didn't have any of that primal pain in there at all. <laughs> I said, yeah, no, I'm not going to either. <laughs> That's not what I want to do. Earth has plenty of that already. It doesn't need any more. <laughs> I'm here for the opposite end of the spectrum, so I wasn't going to do that. <clears throat> so uh, just to alternate, I want to play a piece of my music as an example of ecstatic music. And it's actually the most recent thing that I finished. It's uh, the first piece for, that I finished my next album. It's called Smooth Sailing Over Enchanted Lands. And I apologize in advance that for some reason, my sound system is creating a subtle amount of distortion when hooking up to their sound system. It's not my fault. It's not their fault. Somehow the, the interface isn't working. So I apologize if you hear a little bit of that. It's not their fault. It's not my fault. It just happens to be there. So here is. Smooth sailing over enchanted land, just to give a little stimulation to your right brain. <clears throat> Thank you. 
That's my most recent baby. <laughs> Just rec <laughs> recently hatched. <laughs> okay. Are there any um, electric guitarists in the room? Electric guitarists? I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> when you go to heaven, there's no fuzz tone at all. No fuzz at all. Why, why, why? Because there's no distortion at all. No distortion at all. And fuzz is distortion. Unless you filter out the high frequencies, which is basically smoothing out the sharp corners and the wave shape. I used to practice flute trying to imitate the passionate effects of Jimi Hendrix. I was trying to get a passionate sound, a passionate feeling, like he was on guitar, and no matter what I did, I couldn't get it. And eventually, duh, it occurred to me, a flute sound is not a passionate sound, or a fuzz guitar sound is passionate, you know. <laughs> Do a different sound, you get a passionate effect. It's not gonna get it that way. <clears throat> okay, there's one particular emotion I wish to bring to your attention as a metaphysical tip, and that is the emotion of excitement. You've heard the phrase, follow your bliss, follow your passion, follow your excitement. Well, <clears throat> in my understanding, each of us is a projection from our higher self, which is outside time and space, a projected part of itself here, and that's you. And it's the free will of your higher self that got you here, but once you're here, then you have free will to do whatever you like. Your higher self sees a much bigger picture of all your possibilities than you see. It's like you're in the valley and it's up there in a helicopter seeing everything around you. And you might think, this is the way I should go. Your higher self says, no, no, I'll go that way. It honors your free will, but it sends you hints which way you should go. And that hint is the emotion of excitement. Excitement means you're aligned with your higher self. You are aligned in that instant. If you're excited about doing something, that's your higher self saying, yeah, yeah, do that, do that, do that, do that. And so if you follow your excitement on a regular basis, then you're following the compass heading of your higher self and your life becomes a lot more fun and you end up doing your life's purpose and also enjoying fun with minimum hassles, maximum joy, just by following your excitement. So each day you ask yourself, of everything that's available for me to do right now, what's the most exciting option that I can do without hurting anyone else, you know? And do that, and then late when you follow it as far as you can, say, okay, now of the options that are actually available for me right now, I'm not gonna think about the ones that are not available for right now, but of all the options, what's available for me to do right now, what's the most exciting option, and then do that. If you keep doing that throughout the day, you're following the compass heading of your higher self, saying, yeah, do that, that's the way to go, because you can see much more than we can see down here. We have a lot more fun, a lot less hassle and pain, and we end up doing our life's purpose. So excitement is a very special emotion that way. <clears throat> Sound vibrates as frequencies, your emotions vibrate as frequencies. The more the sound pattern is similar to the pattern of emotions, the more it will affect emotions, the more of an emotional impact your music will have. Good musicians are better at mimicking emotions than uh, other musicians not as talented. But I want you to be conscious of the fact that the more a sound pattern mimics an emotional frequency pattern, the more emotional impact it will have. For example, Vibrato is great for emotional intensity, but don't have such a wide thing on the vibrato that's unrealistic because the emotions don't sweep that much in intensity of pitch. This is an example. Another example is a sliding between notes. Emotions slide between notes. On a piano, you can't slide between notes. On a trombone, you can. On a slide whistle, you can. On a slide guitar, you can. On a voice, you can. But even if you have a uh, synthesizer with portamento, that doesn't mean use portamento all the time. Just use it once in a while. Just use it, da 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 You know, use it once in a while, not on all the phrases. So the more the sound pattern mimics emotional patterns, the more of an emotional impact they will have. One thing which has a powerful impact is uh, vibrating strings, which is why plug strings and bow strings are popular in many cultures, many civilizations, many centuries, throughout the world, because they have a powerful impact on emotions. One thing that's really powerful that I personally am really excited about is feedback on the string. Where the speaker is near the string, 
and the sound from the speaker makes the string vibrate. When the string's vibrating, the electromagnetic pickup hears the string vibrating and feeds it back to the speaker, so you get a loop. And that string can not only sustain, but it can flip into overtones. It has a highly excitatory effect on emotions when a string is flipping into overtones, which is why I'm flipping out all the time. <laughs> I do it a lot myself for that reason. <clears throat> Okay, we are now inundated with so much technology, both in hardware and software, that learning is always a big part of it. And I want to give you some tips for learning. Whether you're reading a manual or watching a video tutorial, I recommend you do it this way. Watch a little bit. When you see them do something, pause, press pause, and then you try it yourself. You try it and explore it when you really understand it, then resume, press play again. When you see them do something else, pause it again. Say, well, it'll take a lot longer if I keep pausing it. Yeah, but that way you're really learning it. If you just watch the whole thing without pausing it, you might have a 12% retention. If you stop it and try every single thing, it might take you a lot longer, but you might have 90% retention instead of 12% retention. You remember and learn way more. So when you're learning anything, whether it's reading a manual or nowadays more of a video tutorial, Stop, pause it, try it yourself, explore it yourself when you really understand it, then continue. <clears throat> my father gave me many advice throughout my life, much advice, and I totally ignored all of it, except for two things, and I follow those two things a lot. One is, whatever you do, specialize, 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 and be the best in your field. And then the other advice was, when you're studying something, take very clear, notes. Take very clear notes. The clearer the notes, the easier you can understand it, grasp it, remind yourself of it, remember it, bring it from long-term memory back to short-term memory. Very clear notes. Um, when I'm learning you stuff, I make my own notes in a Word document. And you know, you can have links with a Word document, just like on a website. You can link to other places on it. So at the top of my Word document, I'll have a table of contents with all the subcategories for what I want to learn within that thing, and if I click on it, it pops me down, you know. Alt-I-K defines an anchor, and then Control-K or Command-K gets you there, you know, for defining anchor points in Word. And I recommend that you use those hyperlinks within a Word document, have a table of contents at the top, so when you find something, oh, this is what I'm looking for, you click on it, boom, you're right there in a Word document. I want to give you an example of really deeply learning something. <clears throat> I got a Korg wave station, and uh, it was such a labyrinth, the menu possibilities, the menu structure, that I really wanted to understand it. So I figured maybe if I schematic it out. So I did that. And I ended up with this. This is for a Korg wave station. Now each of these is from their manual, let's say page of, you know, one window of menus. But I also have lines that I drew between different sections. Why would I do that? Because there are things in different windows that are functionally related. For example, transpose. Over here there's a global transpose. Over here there's a transpose for one part. Over here there's a transpose for incoming MIDI notes. Over here, there's a transpose just for the sounds that you're playing on that keyboard. Over here, there's a transpose just for what you're sending out on MIDI, things like that. So all, each of these orange lines are things that are functionally related, but that are in different parts of the menu tree. And so this is an example of really deeply learning something. Now, what's the advantage of deeply learning something? The more deeply you learn any piece of hardware or software, the more creative possibilities present themselves to you. And if you learn two pieces really deeply, then the possibilities of interacting between them multiply exponentially, not arithmetically. What that means is, I can learn this superficially and learn this superficially and the interactions between them, creative possibilities that occur to me is superficial. If I learn this deeply and I learn this deeply, the creative possibilities of how I can interact them multiply might be 30 times as much. So you can skim the surface like a water skier. 
just skimming the surface, covering a lot of ground. I'll just use the presets on this synthesizer. I'll just use the presets on that keyboard. I'll just use the presets. Or you can go deep and really learn. Wendy Carlos just uses one synthesizer, but she really knows it. Or you can go really deep and just really learn something, sort of like scuba diving instead of, instead of water skiing. What I like to do personally is I like to water ski underwater. <laughs> I like to do both. I like to uh, go deep on something, but go deep with a lot of different things. Because then the creative possibilities, what occurs to you is just wild. They expand infinitely, really, really fast. <clears throat> so I encourage you to learn deeply and take clear notes. Now, I want to talk about organization. <clears throat> you know, if you're in the creative flow, you're creating something, you're really excited, you say, I want to use that sound. Where's that sound? Where's that sound? Oh, I can't find it, I can't find it. Where can I put it? By the time you find the sound, you've lost your creative vision, you've lost the creative flow. If you want to maintain the creative flow, you need to be able to find things and implement things quickly. If it takes more than two minutes, bam, you've lost that vision you're holding in your mind, you're trying to manifest. So what's the point of organization? <clears throat> the point of organization is you in the present doing a favor to you in the future. You in the present is going to take time and energy to organize something so that you in the future, when it's looking for something, it can find it easily. Whether it's a patch, whether it's a sound, whether it's how to hook up certain things together. It's organized. Boom. There it is. Boom. You found it. So you're doing yourself a favor because that way in the future, you're not wasting time. You're not frustrated. You're not losing the creative flow. It's, how did I do that? How did I do that? I wish I could find that sound. It's exactly what I need. I can't find it. I have no idea where it is. By the time you found it, you've totally lost the creative flow. If you want to maintain that creative flow, you need to be able to implement everything quickly. That you can do if you organize things in advance. So it's a trade-off. Organization is more work now for less hassle later. It's more work now for not losing the creative flow later. It's more work now for less frustration later and more just creative fun later. So it's a philosophical question. Do I want to go to the extra hassle and time and effort of organizing this? Or would I rather not put that time but later just be frustrated because I can't find what I was looking for that was so great and perfect for what I want to do? <clears throat> Yes, I have a, a question. Yes. When you're in the creative process, do you try to keep things as organized as possible, or do you spend dedicated time organizing kind of before the That's creative? a great question, which is actually the next thing I was going to talk about. <clears throat> when you're in a creative flow, don't waste your time organizing them. Follow your creativity. But when you're finished with your creativity and you're ready to settle down, then do the organization while it is still in your short-term memory. If you just have some great sounds on some sampler or synthesizer or software synthesizer, create a preset then, you know. When the creativity's finished, you're winding down, you're ready to go to sleep, but it's still in your short-term memory, that's the time to save all those settings. Save the files, save the presets, save the setup you had. Not when you're in the creative flow, but immediately afterwards before you forget it while it's still in short-term memory. <clears throat> Housekeeping, I call it. Okay, now I want to talk about two musical tools that are, in my opinion, extremely underappreciated. They're outrageous tools, they're fantastic tools. They're ignored, they're really underappreciated, they're used superficially. I'm gonna explain what they are. <clears throat> now, Musicians try to create an emotional impact with their music, and if you want to have varying intensity, typically there are three standard ways of having increasing intensity in music. You can make it louder, you can increase the high frequency content like turning up the treble, or you can add vibrato. Those are three ways to increase emotional intensity in the sound. Louder, more high frequencies, vibrato. Now typically musicians implement this, unless it's like a guitar or something where they do it you know, live, but if it's an electronic keyboard uh, like that, they typically do it with a thumb wheel or a foot pedal. It might be ribbon control, but basically one of those. But there's another way that's much more intuitive because let's say I'm doing it with a thumb wheel. It's an abstract, arbitrary connection in my mind that I'm feeling more intense. Therefore, when you're feeling more intense, tell your left thumb to turn up this wheel. 
that's an arbitrary intellectual connection, whereas breath controller is an already pre-wired connection because you breathe more intensely when you're feeling more intensely. Breath controller is an outrageous way to, uh, to vary the emotional intensity of music because already you're pre-wired that your breath correlates with your emotional intensity. When you're feeling more intensely, you breathe more intensely. You, you can breathe more intensely. That can, can, you can set it up to control whatever you want. Loudness, vibrato, more high frequencies, whatever you want. So one of those is breath controller. Now, in the continuous controller chart in MIDI, they made breath controller CC number two. That gives you an idea how important they thought it was. CC number two, continuous controller number two. They must have thought it was really important as they put it that high up on the list. Only the mod wheel is higher up than that, number one. Foot pedal is number four. <coughs> yeah. Yes? Yes. Do you have a dedicated breath control unit that you can use on different synthesizers? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I have a dedicated breath controller that outputs MIDI information. As a matter of fact, I, there's even uh, buttons on it where I can have it output CC2 or CC4 or CC1, but I leave it in CC2 for breath control. But you can have it fake out to where they think it's a mod wheel or a foot pedal. <clears throat> I usually leave it where it is. It's a very subtle emotional way because you can be just holding a note and if you have vibrato, if you have breath controller controlling, let's say a combination of both vibrato and high frequencies, just subtle differences in your breathing will affect the sound. And it's not through your intellect. You don't have to think about it. You're pre-wired. Your breathing correlates with your emotional intensity. So that's one piece of extremely underappreciated musical tool, the breath controller. Sorry. It's not just for Yamaha DX7s. Sorry for interjecting, Yasas. So a lot of the music that you do and what you played for us has that breath control all over the place, doesn't it? That's one of the <laughs> secrets. Actually, actually, a lot of what I do has five channels of communication between me yeah. and the machine. My right hand might be playing notes. My left hand might be adjusting something like high frequencies. My right foot might be on volume. My left foot might be on portmanteau. And breath control might be on vibrato. And all five channels are happening at the same time. And then later I can edit it as many data to fine tune it. But they're all happening at the same time. So I usually have, it's never just, you know, when you see a, a keyboard player with a keyboard rack with four keyboards on the top of each other, that's the most superficial way, it just has one or two channels of communication. You can't have foot pedals dedicated to each one if they're on top of each other. I'd rather waste space but have more communication on each synthesizer rather than conserve space but have less communication, which is what that system is. And so uh, when I perform live, I have two keyboards, each one's got a whole foot pedal assembly underneath just for that keyboard. And I often have uh, Many channels of communication all happening simultaneously. <clears throat> the other extremely underappreciated piece of sound equipment is the vocorder. How many of you really understand what a vocorder does? <laughs> okay, let me explain it to you. Do you know what a graphic equalizer is? Yeah, okay, let's say you have a 10 band graphic equalizer. It's just like a, a normal home amplifier might have bass and treble. That's like a two-band graphic equalizer. With treble, I can crank it up, or I can turn it down, or I can leave it in the middle. With bass, I can crank it up, turn it down, and leave it in the middle. So that's dividing the audio spectrum into two bands, treble and bass. From your point of view, treble and bass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, imagine you have a graphic equalizer with 10 bands. It divides the audio spectrum into 10 bands. And for each one of these, you can emphasize it or de-emphasize it. If I emphasize the highs, I may get more sss. Emphasize the bass, you get more boom. Emphasize the mid-range, you know, you get more mid-range sounds. So you all know what a graphic equalizer is, okay? <clears throat> now, over here, we have a spectrum analyzer. That's passive, it's receptive. It doesn't do anything, it just measures what's coming into it. It measures how much energy there is in each of these bands. A graphic equalizer affects the sound. It can boost it or diminish any one of the frequency ranges. It has an effect. The spectrum analyzer doesn't have an effect. It just measures how much energy is there in each band. 
if, if, if I have a microphone going into the spectrum analyzer, if I go, ah, it's hearing all the frequencies. If I go, mmm, it's hearing mostly the low frequencies. If I go, sss, it's hearing mostly the high frequencies. So that's what a spectrum analyzer is. If you hit cymbal sounds, the heights will be there, but nothing else. If you hit a gong, the lows will be there. If you have a French horn or flute, it'll be in the middle. Piano will be the full range. So a spectrum analyzer analyzes how much sound energy there is in each frequency band, each frequency range. And for now, let's just say we have 10 frequency ranges. And graphic equalizer, the same exact 10 frequency ranges, OK? Let's say we put a synthesizer sound through the graphic equalizer. So it can be doing chords. And on the graphic equalizer, if I have all of them all the way down, you don't hear anything. If I put them up in the middle, you hear the normal sound you'd expect. Or I can emphasize particular frequencies or de-emphasize particular frequencies. On the spectrum analyzer, I have my voice going in with a microphone. All it's doing is listening to this frequency content of my voice. I don't have to sing in tune because it's not noticing pitch. It's just noticing the general frequency range. You don't have to sing in tune. I go ah or ah or ah. It'll be basically the same. It'll be the same spectrum, same envelope. Now here's where it gets magical. Over here, we've got a graphic equalizer with a synthesizer sound going through it. And you can change the sound by filtering it. Over here, we have a spectrum analyzer that's getting sounds from my voice. If I go, mmm, it's only low frequencies. If I go, sss, it's only high frequencies. If I go, ah, it's all frequencies. If I go, ooh, it's mostly mid frequencies. The magic happens is, instead of the graphic equalizer being controlled with your fingers turning the knobs up and down, it's controlled by the spectrum analyzer over here. One-to-one -one correspondence. There are 10 bands here, there are 10 bands there. So on the microphone spectrum analyzer, if I go, mmm, so there's only bass frequencies, then over there, the bass is turned up. Over here, if I go, sss, only the high frequency. So over here, on the synthesizer sound, only the high frequencies go up on the treble. So, the sound of my voice in the spectrum analyzer, it can change as fast as my voice changes. I can go, and it's changing all the time, and it's tracking it in real time over here. All those knobs are going up and down as fast as my voice changes. So it's filtering the synthesizer sound according to the tone of my voice. And that is an infinitely flexible wah-wah pedal. Wow, wow, pedal, you just have you know, a bandpass filter going up and down or a low-pass filter going up and down. This can change all kinds of ways. Now, people use it in the most stupid way, like a robot voice, great, or a person talking, great. That's obvious. It's overused. But they don't use it just as a subtle sculpting tool for tone. It's just the most outrageous sculpting tool for tone. I can be just doing a melody, a beautiful melody, and as it's sounding on the on the spectrum analyzer, I can be singing, and I don't have to sing in tune because it doesn't matter what the pitch is, it only matters the vowel sounds I'm making. And the other sound, it's like all the things are going up and down, just tracking my voice, and it's filtering the other sound in the most organic way. It's really, really organic. So, yes? What kind of vocoder are you using these days? <clears throat> I want to get the new electrosonic one with 256 bands, but what I've been using so far is an old um, Roland. Roland hardware vocoder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're both hardware. They're both hardware. <clears throat> so uh, the two most underappreciated pieces of sound sculpting tools are the breath controller and the vocoder. Okay, now I'm going to get metaphysical. <clears throat> How many of you want to use your sound creation to help other people? Okay, well then you qualify for the first of four criteria. There are music temples on the etheric planes that you can visit while you're sleeping at night. And you can go there and study music. And if you go there on a regular basis, if you get admitted, that is, then uh, eventually <clears throat> the ideas will start, start popping into your mind. Not initially. If you go there every night, after about two weeks, they'll start bubbling up from your subconscious to your conscious mind. You start getting ideas. Oh, this is great. You get more and more ideas. But to really get admitted to these schools, they won't take just anybody. There's certain criteria. Number one, you need to have the sincere desire to create music 
that will uplift other people or heal them or help them. It can't be just for ego, it can't be just for fame and fortune, it can't be just because you want to be a big shot, it has to be because you want to create music that's going to help other people. That's criteria number one. <clears throat> and if you've gotten past that one, then we go to number two. You need to have a reasonable understanding of music. So if you hear some music in your head, you can figure it out what you're hearing so you can reproduce it out here. Number three, you need to be reasonably psychically sensitive. So if they scream it into your mind, you will hear it. And you're not just so scatterbrained with a thousand thoughts and a thousand directions. You never hear it. You never meditate, so you never get quiet enough to hear it. <clears throat> the advantage of meditation is quieting your mind so you can be a receiver. All the static's gone so you can actually receive. So, a lot of people qualify for those first three. Aha! But then there's a fourth one. This fourth one knocks out 99.99% .99 of everybody that's left. I'm one of the ones that got through. <laughs> Here's what the fourth one is. <clears throat> Follow through. What that means is, if they're going to go to all this trouble to get some beautiful composition that will help people into your head and consciousness to where you actually receive it and you're capable of manifesting it, are you going to actually manifest it or are you going to drop the ball because you lost your girlfriend or because you got kicked out of where you live or you have to move out or because you're having troubles with your job? If you drop the ball, they're not interested in dealing with you. They only want people... See, with me, they think of me like a tank. They think of me... My powers of concentration are so developed that they have trouble getting new ideas into my head because I'm concentrating on this thing. But they figure, yes, it's like a tank. If we can just get it in his head, get him to commit to manifesting it, he'll do it and nothing will stop him. Just nothing will stop him. Doesn't matter what happens. He could die and he would still do it. <laughs> so that's the fourth criteria is follow through. They want to know that once they can get that into your head, you will manifest it. You won't drop the ball. You won't stop, oh, I decided to go to vacation to Australia instead, you know. Once you got it, you will manifest it. It may take a while, but you'll do it. That's very important to them. So if you have those four criteria, desire to help others with your music, reasonable sense of music, so that if you hear music in your head, you can figure what it is, reasonably re psychically receptive so you can hear it, and quiet enough, like meditate once in a while so you can get still enough to hear it, and fourth, follow through so you don't drop the ball once they've transmitted a gem to you for you to manifest. <clears throat> Some of you work in places that have a lot of metal or a lot of plastic. So here's a practical tip. If the place where you do a lot of work, like your music creation has a lot of metal around or a lot of plastic around, do not wear synthetic clothing wear cotton or silk. If there's a lot of metal around or a lot of plastic around and you're wearing synthetic clothing, it creates a static charge on you which makes you ill at ease, uncomfortable, dull, and not so sharp mentally. You'll get fogged up much earlier. Whereas if you wear silk or cotton, you don't build up a static charge. You can stay alert way longer and be creative way longer and produce way longer. So just another little tip. If you're in an area that has a lot of metal or plastic, don't wear synthetic clothing while you're working. Wear silk or cotton. Another thing that helps is to have a negative ion generator going because that charges the air. It helps compensate for the static charge. The disadvantage of negative ion generators is, yes, they clear the air, but they dirty the walls <laughs> because uh, negative ion generators release free electrons. They attach to a dirt particle, and then the dirt particle attach to the near surface a wall or the floor. So the walls get dirtier, the air gets cleaner. Newer ones are filtering systems, so they try and catch as much of it as they can. <clears throat> okay, here's another break. Bruce wanted me to bring this to play it for you. This has nothing whatsoever to do with my talk tonight, but he wanted me to play <laughs> this, you. so I'm going to play it. <laughs> this is something I learned from Pan.
your case. You know, this is the simplest thing I do in concerts, and I get the biggest audience reaction from it. <laughs> Frustrating to me. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, you can also sound like crickets. But on an intense full moon Scorpio night, the crickets sound like this. <laughs> I don't want to get bored, so I gotta keep it <clears throat> active. Okay, right now we're living in a very interesting time in musical history because we're living at a time in musical history where computers are getting sophisticated enough, the sound analysis is getting sophisticated enough to where they're getting to where they can do outrageous things with sound. Now computers can do things with sound that even 10 years ago there's no way they could do that, and now they're doing it. Just outrageous. Now I want to bring to your attention three pieces of uh, software that I personally am very impressed by. The first one is Melodyne. Melodyne started life like Anteri's auto-tune, doing auto-tuning. So if you're singing out of pitch, or your slide guitar is out of pitch, or anything's out of pitch, it can correct it. If it's a little bit too sharp, a little bit too slight, it can correct it. But then Melodyne got way beyond just that. It can move each note forward or backwards. It can shrink it. It can expand it. It can change the spectral content to make it brighter or less bright. And here's the outrageous one. You don't need to feed it a monophonic input. You can feed it chords and it can figure out all the notes that are happening at the same time. I couldn't believe it. I had a recording, me playing piano, one of my compositions, chords, the whole thing. I fit into melody, I figured out the whole thing, translated to MIDI, and I had MIDI playing the part along with the original piano recording, and they were doing the same thing. I was amazed, you could actually do it, you do it. So that's an example of things that 10 years ago were just totally, you'd never think of it, you know. So Melodyne can correct the pitch, of a polyphonic signal, not just, you know, you could have a chord on a piano with seven notes, and one of them might be off, the others are fine, and it can correct that one without changing the other notes. Or it can move one note earlier or later, or ex expand it. As a matter of fact, you can have <clears throat> a rhythmic loop, four beats of rhythmic loop, but you want it to fit this amount of time, which is a little bit longer. You can stretch the whole loop to the time to fit the other piece of music you're working on. So that's pretty outrageous. <clears throat> Another one is Sony Spectral Layers Pro. This does surgery on a spectral level. Let's say you're recording somebody singing out in the meadow, and she was singing just beautifully. In the middle of her singing, a dog barked. You put that into Sony Spectral Layers Pro, it can analyze where the dog part is and remove it, but keep the voice there, even though the dog bark and the voice singing are happening at the same time. That's outrageous. 10 years ago, you couldn't do stuff like that. That's just outrageous. And that's an example of what they can do. <clears throat> so it's like the spectral, I call it spectral surgery. The third one is isotope, isotope iris. And this is like a spectral sampler. You can have any general sound, like the sound of brooks or the sound of rustling leaves or the sound of someone walking in gravel. And you can extract particular frequencies to get notes out of it. And then you can play that sound to where you can make out melodies on it if you play it like a sampler. So you can feed it just a random non-note sound, like the sound of wind. And it can extract particular frequencies and turn it into notes so that you can be playing melodies with that wind sound or that person walking on gravel sound. <laughs> That's outrageous. Ten years ago, you couldn't do stuff like that. So we're living at a very interesting time where sound equipment is getting really wild because computers are getting so flexible at analyzing and therefore manipulating sound. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wondered if you could repeat the name of that one. <laughs> Isotope is the company, and it's called IRIS, I-R-I-S. <clears throat> and 
Next thing I want to talk about is a technique for manifesting any complicated creation you have. I use this for music, but you can use it for manifesting any complicated creation like a uh, democratic convention, you know, anything, anything, or a wedding party. Mm -hmm. The same principle applies. In my case, I typically apply it for manifesting a complicated piece of music. <clears throat> it's the zooming in, zooming out technique, and I learned this from Vista, the being that I get musical ideas from, that I work with. He specializes in concentration. So he explained to me how you can use your mind as a zoom lens, telephoto or wide angle. When you're telephotoing in on something, you see one thing, but you see in tremendous detail. When you zoom out, you don't see it in much detail, but you get to see the big picture of everything. Well, this technique for manifesting is alternating between zooming in and zooming out. First, you zoom out. You get to see the overall thing that needs to be done. You get to see the overall structure. You see how all the parts interrelate. Then once you see all that, you see the sequence of events, what order they need to happen in. Well, this needs to happen first. Now I see that that needs to happen second. And this can't happen until that happens, so this will be third. So you get a sequence of events. And you're seeing how all the parts fit in. That's the overview. That's the wide angle. And once you have that, then you go on the first thing on the list. Well, this needs to be done first. Then you zoom in, boom, just on that one thing. So all of your tremendous mental power is no longer thinking of the overall project. It's thinking just of this one step. So you're concentrating it, just like a flame torch. If, you, if you're trying to cut a hole in a flame torch through a piece of metal, if you're moving it all over the place, you never cut through. But if you keep it focused on one spot, it burns a hole right through it. Same thing with concentration. If you can focus it in one area. So after, from the wide angle, you get to see the sequence. You get to see the first thing on the sequence. Then you switch from wide angle to telephoto. And all your mental powers get sharply focused just on that one step. All your energy is on that, it's focused on that, it's intense, and bam, you get it done. Once it's done, then you zoom back again. It says, oh, oh yeah, here's the big picture again. Well, here's my sequence. Well, I did this one, so this is the next step that needs to be done. Then you zoom in again. Zoom in to that second step, and all your tremendous, powerful mental energy is focused only on that second step. You don't think about all the other steps. You don't think about the final outcome. You only think about the step. All your mental power is focused sharply, like a flame torch, just on that step till it gets done. When it's done, then you zoom back to wide angle to see the picture. Ah, oh, making progress. Look, the first step's done, the second step's done. I've only got 13 more steps to go. And here's the third step. This is what I need to do next. Then you zoom in on that. So that's the process. Zooming in, zooming out, zooming in, zooming out. You start out zooming out so you see the overall picture, how all the parts fit together. When you realize all that, you get a sequence of events. Once you get a sequence of events, then you zoom in on just one of those steps, the next step that needs to be done, and you put all of your mental power just on that one step. When it's done, then you zoom out. Go to the next one, that needs to be done next, you zoom in. When it's done, you zoom out. And zooming in, zooming out, zooming out is what gets it done. So zooming in, telephoto, is concentration. Zooming out, wide angle, is basically a great way to receive ideas. Concentration. Telephoto, zooming in, is great for manifesting ideas. Zooming out, wide angle, is great for receiving ideas, assimilation. So that's the zooming in, zooming out technique, which you can use for music creation or for anything, really. <clears throat> Once my creativity started petering out, and I had a dry period. <laughs> it doesn't happen often, it happened once. And then I prayed for creativity. I prayed for creativity. That prayer got answered so abundantly that I had traffic jams of creative ideas. And I developed very sophisticated traffic control. So when I'm flooded with ideas coming in at the same time, I can prioritize and get the most important ones done, then zoom back to the other ones, get them done. So I developed a highly sophisticated technique for traffic overflow with creative ideas. And ever since then, I've had creativity on tap. Like when you want water, you open the faucet, there's the water. When you don't want it anymore, you turn it off. That's how creativity is for me when I want it. Turn it on, there it is. When I've had enough, thank you, I want to manifest that, you turn it off. You manifest that when you want more creativity, you open it up, broom, there it is. Great ideas, done enough, thank you. You close the tap and then you manifest that. So, <clears throat> creativity comes from your higher self. All you really need to do is get receptive to ideas from your own higher self. 
you know how Niagara Falls is always this continuous flow of water? That's how your higher self is with the ideas. It's this infinite, continuous outpouring of ideas, just like Niagara Falls is continuously flushing water all the time, all the time, all the time. In the same way, your higher self is continuously putting out this tremendous flood of ideas, and it's never ending. It never sleeps. It never stops. It's always flowing, just like Niagara Falls. So, if you can tap into your own higher self, well, yeah, how do you do that? Well, the quieter you are, the more clearly you can perceive. There's a metaphor for that. <clears throat> if I'm standing in a pond with water about this deep, now I want to look at the rocks on the bottom. If there are no waves and it's very still, I can clearly see every rock on the bottom. But if there's a lot of waves, I can't see anything. It's just a jumble. Well, water corresponds to the emotion body. And it's the same thing with your emotion body. The more turbulence there is in your emotion, the less clearly you can receive or perceive. The more still you are emotionally, the more clearly you can perceive. So inner reception is proportional to emotional stillness. The stiller you are emotionally, the more clearly you can receive. So you want to get inspiration from your higher self, try to get emotionally still. Ah, calm. How calm? Really calm. How calm? like a glassy lake, not even a wave. On the higher dimensions, they pride themselves on how capable they are of getting emotionally still. There's even a legion of angels whose specialty is stillness, the angels of stillness, and their job is to go places and just radiate the emotion of emotional stillness, just get people emotionally still. The stiller you are, the more clearly you can perceive. That's how you can tune into your higher self, which is a continuous, continuous waterfall of ideas all the time, non-stop, never stops, never takes a break, never goes on vacation. <clears throat> I want to play an example of music uh, from a DVD. This is called The Fountain of Creation. And on this piece, I was trying to create the idea of creation being a continuous fountain of creativity, just non-stop creativity, just going on and on and on, it never stops, a continuous flow of creativity. And being music, I wanted to be Continuously changing emotions, all positive emotions, but continuously changing, just one emotion after another, after another, just a waterfall of continuously changing emotions. So it's called the Fountain of Creation, and then I created visuals to go with it from my DVD. So I'm going to play this, it's short. Yes? Yes, yeah, so can you please share a little bit of how you evolved as a musician into a video producer, and what drew you to video? Just a little bit of background into your video. Yeah, let's do that right after I play okay, this. Good. You asked me the question right after we play this. It'll be more meaningful after we play this. <clears throat>
Thank you. Um, I'm almost finished with my tips. <laughs> Just uh, one more, but basically, Bruce, repeat your question. Something you, about you video. Composed, um, I believe that music was composed before you created yeah. the video. You did the videos afterwards. Yeah. And so that's kind of interesting from a production standpoint. And also just a little bit of your, uh, how you got into doing video. That's a really amazing video production. So. Uh, okay. First of all, there's two ways to do it. You create music to fit the visuals. You create visuals to fit the music. They're both perfectly valid ways of doing it. I've actually uh, created music to fit my friend Ken Jenkins' visuals. As a matter of fact, the piece you just heard was me creating music to fit visuals that he did for this. And I created uh, music to match it. And then later I created my own visuals for this piece. <laughs> so this piece actually has both of them in it. And the way I did it, when I finished my Realms of Light CD, this right here, a lot of people said, and I thought, this is very visual triggering music. This would make a great DVD. But nobody was doing the kind of visuals I wanted to see with it. So I figured, no problem, I'll do it myself. <laughs> Little did I know. <clears throat> four years later, I said, well, okay, now I'm ready to record it. It took me four years to get sufficient uh, mastery of visual special effects to where I felt I was ready to create visuals to go with it. That was tightly synced so that the visuals would be tightly synced with the music. And then three and a half years later, I actually had it finished. So it was a seven and a half year project for me, four years to learn video special effects software, because when I did Crystal Vista in 1980, it was in hardware then, not software. So the whole new learning curve doing it software. A lot of tricks from before didn't work in this game arena. <clears throat> so four years to learn, three and a half years to create the visuals, to fit the music, and I had it done. That's how I did it. And basically, a lot of it was just a plug-in for After Effects, where I just study the manual, experiment, learn, create my own presets creative library of effects. I've got a library of visual effects just like I have a library of sounds. Same idea. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about was uh, stiff time. Musicians are time architects. When computers first started getting into the game of fooling with sound, people thought, ah, oh, finally, now we can have Precise, accurate time, finally. Well, when they did it, they realized, gee, this doesn't sound good, it sounds cold, it sounds lifeless, it sounds mechanical. Well, then they realized that real musicians, time is not stiff, it's not steady. It breathes, it stretches, it expands, it slows down. You have a concert penis, he doesn't play according to the metronome, da, 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 da. They're subtle speeding up and slowing down, subtle speeding up and slowing down. So don't follow the metronome, follow your heart. Let yourself subtly speed up and slow down. Now, there are two different levels of this, macroscopic and microscopic. Macroscopic is tempo, the tempo speeding up, tempo slowing down. The microscopic is groove. How many of you know what groove is? It's subtle adjustments of the timing of 16th notes in a four beat pattern. Like boom, 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 boom. Those are four quarter notes. There are four subdivisions for each one of those. Daka 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 daka. Now you can divide them equally. Daka 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 daka. But a really good rhythm, some of those will be a little bit early or a little bit later. And defining what that timing is is called groove. And with modern software, you can superimpose that groove on something. So you can start with something that's just stiff time. While all 16th notes are exactly equally spaced, you can superimpose the groove. So they'll follow that pattern that you had. What I like to do is sing a rhythm, analyze it, and then create a groove from that, and then analyze, have a rhythm part, follow that groove. If you analyze that, all 16th notes are not equally spaced. Some are a little bit earlier, a little bit late, and that's what groove is. So on the microscopic level, avoiding stiff, stiff time means using groove. Do not have all 16th notes be equally spread apart. On the macroscopic level, it means let your tempo breathe. Let it speed up and slow down. Now, the only possible excuse for using a metronome is if you're doing dance music. Okay, with dance music, you can have stiff time with tempo, but even then you can have a groove on the microscopic level. So avoid stiff time, follow your heart, don't follow the metronome. So that ends my tips. <laughs>